I'm Gary Sheffer, and I got interested in the General Worth Hotel in Hudson because my grandparents lived two doors from it on Warren Street. My grandfather ran a pool hall uh, for 50 years on Warren Street, and the General Worth was the centerpiece of social and economic activity in the city. Uh, every Rotary, Lions, Chamber, you name it, met there. But in the early days, of course, it was uh, salesmen who came uh, you know, on the stagecoach, later in automobiles, to sell their wares in Hudson. And it was right on that sort of um, line between New York and Albany, and people had to stay over uh, for the night in Hudson, and so the General Worth was the place to go. So I'm gonna talk tonight a little bit about the personal side of it, the history of the hotel, and then try to wrap it up in a story about the community of people who lived in that neighborhood. So hopefully this will stay. So I want to I want to start by saying um, I'm a Hudsonian. I am not a historian, and you're probably going to figure that out in a few minutes. Uh, but I spent most of my life, as Brenda said, being a storyteller. Uh, about 40 years in journalism, politics, and corporate world. Um, so my story tonight is going to be light on history and long on storytelling. And the story is about the hotel itself. And I call it a community of worth because of the remarkable communities that surrounded the hotel, that lived and worked in it, ultimately in the community that fractured uh, over its fate, uh, resulting in its demise. Um, again, it's not a debate about what happened in 1969, although that is part of it. Um, it is about a place that intersected with the lives of the people in Hudson in so many ways, particularly between the two and 300 block of Warren Street, it was a neighborhood of working class people, many of whom were immigrants, uh, who watched the elite of Hudson come and go through the doors of the General Worth during its heyday. The story starts with this photo um, this is the photo of my parents' wedding day, um, and that's my mom, May 26, 1956, by the way. That's my mom, Rachel Borelli Sheffer, in the wedding gown, obviously. And my dad, Kenneth Red Sheffer, who's trying to behave in front of his new mother-in-law, <laughs> Anna Borelli, to the right, and believe me, you wanted to behave in front of my grandmother. Um, by the way, uh, I believe that's Richard Conqueror. The boy with the crew cut, uh, and Rose is—is is that you think that's right? Rose Costick who lives next door. Rose, I think that's you behind him, sort of obscured behind him. Um, they both, both, both Richard and Rose lived within two doors of uh, the General Worth. So, for us, it really was the hotel next door. Um, for these people that I just mentioned, um, you know, I grew up in Hudson on Union Street first and then on Jocelyn Place, but we spent a lot of time uh, at my grandparents' house, two doors from the Worth, and I hope. <coughs> if you look closely at this picture, which was taken in 1969 before the hotel was torn down, see that double, co double cola sign? That's the sign of my grandfather's pool hall, which he called Red Billiards but everybody else called Borelli's. The Pepsi sign is um, Paramount Grill, where my parents met on their first date. Right? They got married around the corner at Mount Carmel Church at Union and Second. My grandparents lived above the pool hall, and their best friends and next-door neighbors, of course, were the Roberts, who lived somewhere right there. <laughs> So that's what I mean by the hotel next door. For us, this was, this intersected with our lives every day, and I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So, this is my mom. Let's try it, if I go back. Maybe it's overheating. Okay, let me try it again. So this is my mom in various stages of her life with getting her picture taken in front of the General Worth Hotel. <laughs> and this is that you know, balustrade there, that railing is where the Roberts lived. That's First Holy Communion. I believe this is Easter. It makes sense, right? I think that's Mary Tanzillo, maybe. I don't know. And 
And by the way, tonight, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, I hope, of people, I don't know who they are. So if anybody knows who they are, just please yell it out, because I'd like to continue to collect this. And that's my mom on the right for some event, and I don't know who that man is. So maybe I should be worried about that. <laughs> but all with the general words in the background. And then this is my mom at an event. The late photo was labeled at the general words. It looks like she's in high school. And you may remember Ruth was a uh, bridesmaid in the wedding you saw earlier. And I'm going to say it wrong. Ke Kena? Kena. Kena. Right. So again, here's my mom at the general words. And then here's my mom and father, again, trying to behave. <laughs> I think they were, on, they were on a date at the general worth. My mom doesn't have a wedding ring on, so it must be obviously before they got married. That's Nancy Sullivan in the background and Eddie Sullivan. Eddie was in my parents' wedding. I don't know who uh, the woman to Eddie's left is there, but it's obviously a place where they socialized and saw their friends. And then here's another picture from the wedding day, and I show this only because this is what a lot of people, when I talk to them about the General Worth Hotel, tell me, is that this was a place where people came out onto the street to see the weddings, the proms, um, and you could see it going down the street toward Riley's there. People were lining up on this day, and there are other photos of people out in front of the hotel. I think uh, that's my parents' friends from Albany, um, Rosenstead Cone, standing on the sidewalk right down the down the street so again uh, another example of uh, my parents involvement with the, with the work now I said the demolition wasn't part of the story that I was going to tell but of course my grandfather was mayor of Hudson from 1970 to 73 Elmer Sheffer his campaign slogan was Hudson's first full-time mayor um, and he was president of the Common Council and a candidate for mayor in 1969 when this debate was going on about what to do about the vacant hotel. And a reporter from Albany actually asked him what he would do about the hotel if he were elected. And he said, I would go along with the people who asked to restore the Worth Hotel if they show me and those in city government that they can restore the building to somewhat its original appearance and tell us with concrete answers that they will take care of the upkeep and running expenses, right? So this was his official campaign platform about the worth. Um, so I just show you this again because to show the family connection on both sides, I'm gonna show you more uh, related to the worth. But this is the hotel I remember, right? This is the hotel that we used to walk by on the way back from church at Mount Carmel. So we, my parents would drop us off um, at Mark Carmel, we'd go to Mass, we'd walk around the corner after Mass and stop at Riley's store, um, south of the hotel, or west of the hotel, I'm sorry, and we'd buy the New York Daily News for my grandfather, uh, 25 cents, and uh, then we'd go to my grandparents' house for Sunday breakfast. So many times on the way home, from church, we would play on these steps. We'd sometimes go around back, uh, where there used to be a dining terrace. You could get in that way, you could get in the hotel, uh, that kind of thing, until my grandmother, who you saw earlier, found out that we were doing that on the way home from church and forbid us from even crossing the line of the sidewalk onto the onto the general worth property, and we were really afraid of my grandmother, so we listened to her. <laughs> so I said this wasn't about history, but I think you have to understand a little bit about the history of Hudson to understand this story about community that uh, I'm trying to tell. Um, this was um, uh, the Tremont House, which is was in Boston, and upon which the general worth is uh, modeled after. Uh, there, was a, there was a predecessor hotel in, really, on the property that is now 213 and 215 Warren Street. It was, at the time, it was in the 80s, the address. And in 1786, it opened, it was called Kellogg's. And like the hotels of the time, it wasn't really a hotel. It was a house that somebody converted 
into an inn. And it was quite popular, as many as 200 people on the stagecoach line uh, between New York and Albany and other places stopped there for meals or accommodations um, every day. Uh, in, 17, um, uh, or in 1837, it burned down, this Kellogg's Inn, which had a big picture painting of uh, General George Washington out in front of it. It was quite well known. And it burned down, apparently it was a spectacular fire. Uh, Catskill came to the aid of Hudson because Hudson couldn't put it out, but nonetheless, the hotel was a complete loss. And this is again what I mean about community. So the people who owned the property where the Kellogg's Inn had been uh, realized that Hudson needed a good hotel. And they donated the land for that purpose. About five or six businessmen in the city of Hudson um, donated or provided the financing for the construction of the hotel, hired a contractor, and allegedly they built the new hotel um, in less than 100 days. And they named it the Hudson House, and it was, um, <coughs> hopefully, it was modeled after the Tremont House in Boston. And you can see the similarity, right? Yeah. The Doric columns, the sort of the Greek Revival architecture. And these were in this, along with the Astor House in New York City and the Worth, were really the first modern urban hotels in the country. So it's historic in that sense. And at the time they tore down the General Worth in 1969, um, this was the last one remaining. Both the Tremont House and Astor Place in New York City had been torn down. And so one of the arguments by preservationists was this was the real last model of um, Greek Revival architecture uh, in, in the country. So here's the earliest drawing of, or illustration of, a, uh, of the Worth House that I could find. It's 1869, and the proprietor was C.H. Uh, Miller. Um, and the interesting thing about this photo to me is that you can see uh, right over here the entrance to the stables in the back, right? And so there was a stable in the back that housed about 60, was able to house about 60 horses. Um, and you can still see that federal style sort of addition to the work that came later. But um, people would pull up with their horses and then go through into the back. And that, those stables were there until 1937 when they were uh, torn down. Uh, you can see this is the earliest ad that I can find from 1871 for the Worth House. And I really like this part of it where it says it's accessible to depots and steamboats, right? But here's the point I was making before in this quote, and this is by a guy named John Wade who wrote a little bit of history of the Worth for the Department of Interior in 1969. And it's important about what the, how this bustling the city of Hudson was at the time the Worth was built, which is the building reflects, reflects the days when Hudson was a prosperous whaling port and a center of river trade. It indicates that Hudson was important enough commercially to warrant a modern hotel, which was comparable to the newest hostelries in Boston and New York City. Right, so that's how important Hudson was to this route of merchants and salesmen and everything that traveled through this region of the country. Gary, it's interesting that the numbering on the street was different. See, 81, 81. Exactly, exactly. And, and um, there's been several different numbers. It was 217 at one point that I could find, Gene, but uh, uh, this was in the eight, 1870s, it was 80s, I think that. So um, this is the first sort of illustrated piece of, it clearly shows um, the Worth House. This is a postcard that's in our collection. Brenda talked about our collection. I just happened to stumble across it the other day. It's a 1905 postcard, and you can see the hotel on the right, and you can see the cobbled street, sort of, and you can see the, the trolley that ran up and down the center of the street. But the thing I loved about this was the back of the postcard, which it's from a woman, and I can't read her name, from Osning, New York. And she said, 
Uh, the card says, had three blowouts and have only arrived here. Wake up early, start in the morning, and hope to reach Syracuse. So again, it shows you how people use the words, right? She was coming up from Osling in Westchester County, trying to get out to Syracuse, and this was her stopping point. Um, and she had three blowouts. I, I assume those are tires, right? Not parties. So. <laughs> uh, but anyways, it's like... And then, and then here's a picture. This, these pictures that you see like this, that are sort of yellowish, um, were, were donated to the library by uh, Marcella Stuppelby. And they're undated. Um, but uh, they show the worth and what it was like in its heyday. And this is the kind of folks that you, you know, saw stay here on a typical, you know, on a typical day. Um, and you can see the pillars and the, you know, the great entrance to it, two steps up that were marble. And at some point there was, and they were removed, Charlie told me about this, there were a couple of sort of granite sort of things where you step down from your horse onto these so you could get out of And those were removed at some point. Um, but um, these pillars, Bernard Weaver, who used to live in Hudson, told me a story about these pillars. And I may get the dates wrong, but um, his father used to take him to the Rotary at the, at the uh, hotel. And when he was very young, his father would point to him to two holes uh, in one of the pillars. And he told him it were bullet holes, right, from the anti-rent demonstrations that went on back in almost 100 years um, before this. And, um, and, you know, it sounds like a really good story, right? You know, for a father to tell, uh, you know, a five-year-old or six-year-old kid. But I was looking through some, uh, there's an unnamed um, history of the hotel. And um, let me just read this. I thought the story was, you know, I thought Ber Bernie was making, Bud was making it up. But let me read to you what I found in this um, history. It says, in 1844, during the excitement of the anti-rent riots, the Emmett Guards were formed for protection. I assume they're like a militia of some kind, meaning the Emmett Guards. One dark night, about midnight, a sentry, Bagley, stationed at the Hudson House, was fired upon by anti-rent agitators, alone and on horseback. The ball lodged in one of the columns of the hotel. The sentry escaped. So apparently, uh, it's a true story. It wasn't just for the, his son's entertainment. Uh, if you look at this, you can see, obviously, the hotel changed hands many times over the years. And um, I'll go through it quickly. Um, in 1850, the hotel was acquired by William Badgley, who changed the name from Hudson House to Badgley's Hotel. In 1859, the, house, the hotel was purchased by Cornelius H. Miller for $17,000. He changed the name to the Worth House in honor of General William Jenkins Worth, a native of Hudson. You know, General Worth was only a native of Hudson because his parents got stuck here in a snowstorm when he was born here. But good enough for me. Uh, he and his sons, Charles and Harry, ran the hotel for 70 years. Um, Mr. Miller later sold the hotel around 1917 to the Worth House Corporation made up of local businessmen. And by the way, the youngest Miller, there were four generations of Millers that ran uh, the hotel. Parker Pye Miller was born in room 44 of the hotel. He managed it briefly. He got the name Pye because he won a blueberry pie eating contest and the name stuck. But um, he said, he did some interviews back in the late 60s. He said the hotel was a dog during certain periods of its history. The prosperous times were when Hudson was a thriving river port and stop off on the way to the springs at New Lebanon and during the early years of the automobile. In 1903-04, he said, we were flat broke. The clientele off the boat carried their bugs with them, and it was sort of a depression period. The arrival of the automobile rescued the hotel, Miller said. We cleaned up when the auto came in. We never had room. People came from New York City to Hudson on their way to Albany or to Lenox and Stockbridge, Mass. Later, those stopovers were no longer required as the automobile improved, helping, therefore, to lead to the worst demise, as I mentioned before. But back to our parade of owners. 
1934, the property was sold to the Potts Memorial Hospital of Livingston, and the name was changed to the General Worth Hotel. It was in fact bought at a public auction for $52,000. In 1943, it was sold to Edwin J. Thomas, proprietor of the well-known Sawpaw Hotel in Catskill, I don't know if I'm saying that right, and the Hudson paper gushed, Hudson and the traveling public are indeed fortunate to have attracted their interest, meaning the Thomases, in the local hotel property. In acquiring the general worth, Mr. Thomas comes into possession of more than a public inn. It is one of the city's venerable institutions with a rich historical background of public service, reaching back to the stagecoaching days. Well, he didn't like the hotel very much because three years later he sold it to the Hotel General Worth, Inc., a New York City syndicate. And then ultimately in 1969, the city bought the hotel for back taxes. And ultimately, when the building was demolished and it was a vacant lot, they sold the lot for $1,700. So, so not over that lot. Yeah. So if you're keeping score, right, this is the history of the hotel and the names that it operated on in the period. Right? So went from Hudson House to Badgley's Hotel to Worth House to the General Worth Hotel for its last 30 years or so. And thanks to the Hudson DAR, I found a full page ad of, um, for the hotel in 1923, I believe, and it was in the Daily Star, and uh, it talked about the rejuvenation that the hotel had gone through. Every one of these owners did their own renovation, their own improvements, and so I love this language, though. It's a big full-page ad, and it said, the worth, a monument to the staunchness, the artistic sense of Hudsonians of long ago, has, under the hands of its present, own, present owners, gone through a rejuvenation. <laughs> staunchness, that's what you all think, of course, when you think about it, right? Hudsonians, <laughs> staunchness and artistic sense. And then this is another, this is another uh, picture from that ad. That's the lobby. Uh, looking toward the restaurant in the back. Um, this is the restaurant uh, from that ad, again, 1923. This was a typical bedroom, according to the ad. You see, very comfortable. And the hotel became known for its very comfortable sort of colonial style, right, that people, uh, people liked. And then, again, this is one of Marcella Stumplebean's photos. Um, you can really get a sense for it here. This is undated. I don't know when this was taken. But that's the staircase going up to the second floor. Um, and I think I have another one here. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, one of her photos looking toward. That's the reception desk. That's the entrance to the, to the hotel there with um, the uh, stairs going up. And this was really the lobby was, you know, sort of the the gathering place for a lot of things where people had events and cocktail receptions. And uh, I talked to Tony DeCrosta, this is now 30 years ago when I talked to him. Um, he, he was a desk clerk in 1937 at the hotel. He worked 12 hours a day for 11 bucks, meals and board if you wanted it. Uh, he told me the lobby was a real social center. People would congregate before, uh, there before a dinner or a wedding. And you may see a quote here from Don to Casey of Hudson, who of course later became the county clerk. And Don was a bellhop at the hotel, and he made four dollars a week plus tips. But he said the salesmen were not good tippers. So, and he meant when he, he told me that. So um, that's the the lobby. And then talking again about renovations, you can see every renovation was heralded in the newspapers as the next, you know, this great change. This article about opening a new tap room in Cocktail Lounge goes on for 15 inches. Every detail, the night line, oh, yeah. all of that. Oh, uh, that photo is from 1953. It's the first photo I could find uh, of, the, of the tap room. And uh, it, uh, it featured, as you can see in the headline there, cocktail hour was from 4 to 7. Sounds pretty good to me. And then dancing was from 10 to 2. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, 
so the best part of the story uh, of the Worth Hotel, obviously, is about the people who worked at the Worth or um, stayed there. So this, these are two um, photos of waitresses from the Worth. Again, I don't know who any of these folks are. This one was taken in 1954. And that one is one of uh, Marcella's pictures, which is undated. You can see that they changed uniforms at that time from the black yeah. with the white trim to um, the all white. Uh, I did interview many years ago Irene Bogarski, I think her last name was. And she was a waitress there during the 1940s. And she told me all the doctors came there to eat Dr. Edwards, Dr. Spencer. They were all the best, and they came to the Worth because that was the place to go. Uh, Irene said waitresses made $10 a week, but made big money from tips. And she said, at the time, you could make as much as some of the girls made today. That was 1985 when she told me that. The clientele we had were all good tippers, and sometimes you could make as much as 100 bucks a week. Now, she also told me that she would be required to come in for breakfast and lunch, and then go home, and come back for dinner, evening events, and stay till 2 o'clock in the morning. So they, they earned their money. And again, if anybody knows who these folks are, please, uh, please let me know. Here's, I know, I think we have a bartender, former bartender from the Worth here tonight. Here. Former bartender. Okay, so a lot of people talked about this bartender. His name was Nicholas Rose. Um, Thomas Flanagan was another bartender. And he told me about, a lot about Nicholas Rose. He said he was a big draw at the Worth. Um, this photo, it came from Joseph Sesternino, and it's, it's undated, but he's on the back veranda of the Worth. And apparently, Nick knew all the gossip in Hudson and wasn't afraid to tell it. <laughs> um, and uh, he just said that uh, Nicholas was, uh, people came from all over uh, to see him. He had a following as far as New York City. He was the best bartender you ever saw. Uh, by the way, Thomas, when he worked there, he made $25 a week plus tips. And the drinks, I asked him, the drinks were 25 cents a piece. So, uh, sounds like my kind of place. Um, and then Tony DeGrosse, who was a desk, desk clerk, also said people would go down there just to listen to him. I also have another photo of, uh, here of someone who looks like a bartender with uh, the apron on and the short black tie, but I don't, again, don't know who that is. I don't know. Who's, my, who's our bartender? When did you work there, sir? I uh, was at the worst house back in 1950, I'd say 58, 59, 57. Years. Okay. Yeah. Did you know Nicholas Rose? Did I know who? Nicholas Rose? No. No? He, uh, at that time, uh, a couple from New York bought the worst right. house. It was Mark, his name was Mark. They were probably the last uh, okay. Yeah, they were the last owners. Yeah. And these are just some other workers in the back, again, a donated photo and, and no identity or date on them. And it was said that the workers at the Worth Hotel had great pride in, you know, in working there. This is a, you know, some kind of parade uh, you can see on Warren Street, and there was a Worth Hotel carriage float for the parade. And lots of folks told me how proud they were to work at the Worth, because it was the best. Now, as I said, it's also about the people who stayed there. And uh, there was the widow Best. And you may know this story. Uh, her name was Beatrice Best. Um, and her husband was the mayor of Hudson in 1932-33. He, uh, his name was Archland Best. And while he was still in office, apparently he was an aficionado of speedboating in the river. His boat stalled in the river. He was trying to get it started. And it finally started. And when it did, it threw him off the back stern of the boat and into the river. And the story goes on to say that the mayor came up twice but didn't come up a third time. And um, so the widow Best, who she was widowed, uh, stayed in the in the... General Worth uh, for several years, had a double room, and all the folks that I talked to remembered her. She later, he was, Archman, in addition to being mayor, 
was the president of Best Coal in Hudson. And she went on later to marry and move uh, into New York onto Park Avenue. So she did well the second mm -hmm. time as well, too. <laughs> um, this was a, a story that a lot of people have heard about, the Worth Hotel. This is the famous writer Henry James. Um, and uh, he came into Hudson in 1905 and in a, in a motor car, apparently, and with two women and a, and a poodle. And he tried to get some dinner at the Worth, and they said, no, you're not welcome here with the dog. And they went out to a cook shop and found a meal. And you can see what he says here. He said, the best here, meaning Hudson, to speak of was the motor went under, underwent repair and that its occupants foraged for dinner, finding it indeed excellently at a quiet cook shop about the middle of the long drawn way, which is Warren Street. Yeah. He's referring to Warren Street there. After we had encountered coldness at the door of the main hotel by reason of our French poodle. <laughs> right? He doesn't name the words, but that's certainly it. And this was in sort of a travel log that he wrote uh, about his travels around the region. I can see, just looking at that picture, why he wasn't well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the dog. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to go through some uh, events at the word. Oh, sorry, I have a question here. What was the quiet cook shop? I don't know. Don't know. That's all it, it's, it's written. Quiet cook shop, would that be a restaurant? Yeah, a restaurant of some kind, yeah. yeah but he doesn't, he doesn't specify what it was. So I want to go through some of the events. This was the place to have events, of course, which I mentioned before was at uh, the Worth. Um, lots, lots, lots of events. And um, every civic organization you can imagine had its event there. Let me go through a list. The Lions, the Rotary, the Women's Auxiliary of the Medical Society, the Columbia County Historical so Association, the Tuberculosis Eradication Association, the Junior Service League, the Hudson Business Professional Women's Club, the Columbia County Ministerial Association, the Boy Scout, the St. Mary's Alumni Association, and in 1944, a group called the, De the Degree of Pocahontas, yeah. which held its annual dinner and installation at the work. And the Hudson Daily Star breathlessly reported of the, of the upcoming meeting, it is expected the great Pocahontas, Anna Gannon, will be present. <laughs> so I don't know what the you know, degree of Pocahontas was. I, I did look it up, uh, you know, what they were, and all it said was they were an auxiliary of the improved order of red men. That was it. That's, they did mention it was, there were no Native Americans in this group. It was all like, but, uh, but it was political events that people most remember. And Pat Martin Westerman, who grew up at number two Warren Street, was a member of the Women's Republican Club and remembers seeing Nelson Rockefeller at a fundraiser at the Worth. And I'm gonna, I have a little tape from Pat on this. Let's see if we can play it. In my mind's eye, I can still see Nelson Rockefeller up and down all these crowds of people in the dining room of the General Worth and winding his way through all the tables, shaking hands and people just trying to get up to shake his hand. Uh, I remember crowds and crowds of people, beautiful high ceilings and lots and lots of tables. Um, but after that, out in the cars and gone for the day. So it was... Uh the political events that really captured people and what people came out. This is a 1951 photo by Howard Gibson. Uh, if you go to photobygibson.com, you'll see a lot of great local history. And it shows uh, the frenetic activity out in front of the hotel for a fundraiser for Walter A. Lynch, a Democrat who was running for governor. And it, you know, I mean, just look at the people running down the street, state police, the banners, I mean, it just shows you what Warren Street was like at that time. Um, and Walter A. Lynch, by the way, got crushed <laughs> by Thomas Dewey in the election. So, um, but looks like they had a nice event at the, uh, at the Worth anyway. Um, <laughs> and then here is, you know, a lot of people remember Eleanor Roosevelt at the Worth. 
She visited several times. Charlie used to sneak over across the street and then look through the windows to see Mrs. Roosevelt. You can see the great photo of the president behind her. I don't know who, this fellow shows up in a lot of photographs. I don't know who he is. Is it Judge Connor? I don't know. If, I'll have to ask Jack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you can see that, and then that's the, that's the crowd that night. And now, it was said that you know, the hotel allegedly um, held 300 people. Um, I feel a little doubtful just looking at uh, this photo. And um, there is some reporting that says the biggest bash ever held at the Worth was in, um, what year was it? It was in 1935 when 236 people celebrated the opening of the Rip Van Winkle Bridge at the Worth. In attendance were Gover Governor Hugh Herbert Lehman and Hudson Mayor Frank Wise. Um, then if you look at this photo, um, this is a photo donated by, um, it's by Howard Gibson, but uh, donated by Mary Driscoll to the library. Mary Driscoll's mother, Margaret Collins, was the president of the Columbia County Women's Democratic Club. And um, let me just make sure I got my right slide here. I'm going to go forward one here. Oops, oops. And um, these photos show some of the events that night in 1954. Um, the reason I show you this photo is because of the mural. A lot of people remember the mural behind the bar at the Worth. This was done by a guy named Hugh McKay, who was an apparently well-known artist. Um, he was from Chatham Center. And it depicts the history of Hudson in Athens uh, and the Hudson River in Catskills with a whale, the half moon, Oana, all make an appearance in it. And the question that people most ask me about what happened to that mural um, when the hotel was torn down, uh, I don't know what happened to the mural, but there was a life-size painting of General Worth uh, in the lobby. It was also done by McKay from Chatham Center. Um, and I tracked it down, and um, I think, by the way, this shows the, uh, his greatest background here. It's his greatest victory in the Battle of Monterey. He was sort of an American hero in the Mexican War. Um, and the painting, when the hotel was torn down was um, bought by a Fort Worth, Texas businessman, and today hangs in the Worthington Renaissance Fort Worth Hotel in Texas. So we also, by the way, have um, a descendant of one of the Worth, of the Worth family here tonight, <coughs> Kathy. Um, Kathy Poe. Kathy, well, how are you guys related to the Worths? My um, father's mother, or my grandmother on my father's side was a Worth. Okay. And he was never married. General Worth was never married or had any kids. So he's my sixth great back uncle. Sixth great back uncle. Yes. Just like that, you guys. Yeah. 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 When Kathy was nice enough to bring tonight, this is actually a picture of the um, sinking of the Swallow, a steamboat. And this was given to you because of your family connection, right? Kathy? My father. Okay. was the youngest of the, um, his mother's kids. Okay. So when it was torn down, they gave him that and the two mugs. You Let me show you the two mugs, which are fantastic. These mugs, I guess, are moose. Oh. Moose. Oh. <laughs> from, from the hotel. Oh, wow. Which is just fantastic. And I promise not to drop their stuff. Or step on. So, um, so anyways, that's, um, so here's the photo I was talking about before, donated by Mary Driscoll, lives in Selkirk now. Her mother is Margaret Collins, president of the Women's Democratic Club. Um, this is 1959 now, so you can see how Mrs. Roosevelt has changed. Um, her um, brother, uh, Mary Driscoll, the son, this, this guy right here, John C. Collins Jr., who, ironically or coincidentally, I guess, uh, contracted polio in high school and was in a wheelchair all his life, similar to FDR. And does anybody know um, who the person to the right of Mrs. Roosevelt is? No. Gore Vidal. <laughs> That's right. Gore Vidal, the author. 
he ran and he ran for Congress in uh, 1959 and also got crushed um, when he's a famous American, famous American writer. Which one is Mayor Kelly? Oh, the boutonniere. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Foods. I, I couldn't find much about food at the hotel. Uh, you guys, I put on some of the seats a menu uh, from uh, 1943 that I found online. You know, the shrimp cocktail and the prime river sold out. Um, and look at this from 1948. Dinner for um, 43 people for 86 bucks. Right? So, and you can see that it was. Uh, a Mrs. Nathaniel Gardner from Germantown had this event. Doesn't say what kind of event it was. Wine was ten dollars and seventy-five cents for forty-three people, and then at the bottom there was uh, a cake for fourteen bucks. So the cake cost more than the wine. So I also asked my 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 wife Barbara to hand around. I found on eBay. You guys can take a look at this, and then we'll donate them to the library. Some matchbook covers from the General Worth in St. Charles. Uh, they're kind of interesting, but they talked a lot about their food. And uh, in the 1960s, you could find a lot of ads in the Hudson paper about the fine French cuisine. I don't know if that was true, but that's how they advertised uh, themselves. I talked about my grand grandfather, Elmer Sheffer. Uh, his daughter, Elizabeth Sheffer, now Elizabeth Sheffer winning, um, used to go to the hotel. This was the dining terrace in the back of the hotel. And um, Bitsy, my Aunt Bitsy, uh, went there, her, uh, her uh, grandmother Mimi took her there. And they, this is what she said, the tea was served at lovely little tables in the garden behind the hotel, along with tea, um, where little sandwiches with the crusts off and the petit fours. On the sandwiches was cream cheese with strawberry jelly on white bread. I thought it was the best thing ever. And, and she wore, for, the, for these trips to the hotel with her grandmother, she wore the dress that she wore to my, grand, my mother's wedding. So there was another connection there. So that's about all I could find on food uh, with those um, menus and such. Uh, before I talk about this, uh, the best story that I've heard about the hotel and the people who live near it, Charlie used to run in the back and steal bottles, but, you know, for two cent deposits. <laughs> they, took all the, they took all the entries and they put them under that veranda that you showed. That picture right there is the picture that the hotel was this one. Yeah. When, when I was a kid, that's what it looked like. Okay. All right. And they put the bottles and under it? You see that staircase right there? Yeah. To the right of that. There was you know, a veranda went all the way around. Underneath that veranda, they had all they kept all the bottles, and they were all two cent deposit bottles. Uh -huh. They didn't have much any money. Get our wagon, get it up with terrific up the bottles, and go. The only problem is we, we couldn't get rid of them at one store. We had to go all the hundred. <laughs> Five bottles here, three bottles there. And all the that they took. That's great. Well, so that's a great story. And Jean, if you don't mind, Brew, who lived across at 220? Uh, we lived at 220. Charlie's my cousin, our grandmother owned the house, and he lived with my grandmother and mom, and, you know, and I, we lived on the second floor in that apartment, and I had, you know, a direct view of the, the hotel. And, um, you want me to stand Yeah, if you don't mind, Jean. Um, and, um, I lived there like from 1956 till I went off to college and one of the things I remember most is coming home from Oneonta for summer. I was about 19 years old, you know, a girl. It's folk song period, you know, when everybody was who dannying and everything, okay. So it's evening and I hear this sound outside. And I look out the window of our, our living room was just directly across from that porch and portico. And there's these guys on the top of the roof of that portico thing playing guitar. And it turned out they were from Dartmouth College. And I think they were there on some kind of like, they were taking science courses and it was some kind of a trip for like geology or something. But they were staying over at the hotel. But I am in, I'm 19. These guys are cute. They're playing folk music. I am like, wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm just like dreaming about how do I go over and talk to them. 
my mother, okay, who sometimes like to have a couple of drinks, okay, <laughs> um, decided that they were a nuisance and she called the police and the police came and chased them off the roof. I was so mad at <laughs> but um, it was just really something to live across from it and watch. I mean, we would look out the window and, you know, look for Eleanor and look for the whatever was happening over there. And it was just like, you looked out the window and you got to see what was going on. And the funny thing is, I said when Gary was talking to me, he talked about the weddings there, and I said, well, geez, in our family, we weren't, you know, we didn't have enough money to go to the General Worth for weddings. We were the Elks Club weddings. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was really, really something to live yeah. And I, I graduated from college in 67, got married in 70. And I remember, you know, getting ready for the wedding, and there was this, just this empty lot across the street. And even though, I don't know, it just really, it was it something went, to see it go. It went from yeah. a beautiful hotel to a hardware store. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know, it's funny how you said that it, something, it sold for $17,000. My dad owned um, Rockies in Hudson, and um, it's the city hall place, and two things. Um, you were talking about the pool hall and how they called it Borelli's, yeah. not what his real name was. My dad's restaurant was really the Community Grill. Oh, Nobody know. ever called it the Community no. Grill, they called it Rockies. And um, when my mother sold my father's, she sold it for exactly $17,000. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it here. You know, so this community that so loved this hotel, really fractured in the 60s. You know, the hotel, you know, business in the city got slower. Um, the hotel had less business. And finally, in about 65, although there's some different dates, uh, closed down. And it was vacant for several years. Um, you know, so uh, it had been a hotel since, you know, 1786 in many ways. The masonry, they didn't paint the front. Uh, the masonry started to fall apart, all the things you saw in some of those other photos. Um, and uh, in 19, May 1968, the city, you know, it fell to the city from uh, a tax sale. And Mayor Sam Wheeler uh, searched for people to buy uh, the hotel and in re restoring it, but he didn't find any. So the city had to make a decision about what to do about it. Um, some residents of the neighborhood um, feared for safety, fire. It did get pretty, you know, grimy, as you guys know. Um, uh, homeless folks, I remember the pigeons. The pigeons were just, you know, innumerable. Um, and, uh, you know, Mayor Wheeler said it would take at least $250,000 in 1969 money to refurbish hotel, and some, some were, uh, estimates were higher. Um, other residents and preservationists uh, rallied around the hotel. Um, I went to Mark Carmel, and Mark Carmel at one point considered it for a community center. The local YWCA got involved and thought maybe they could use it for a number of purposes. And then the Hudson River Valley Commission got involved, mm -hmm. the State Historical Trust, uh, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, advocated for his presentation. Petition, a petition drive was started, and it all came to a head in September 1969 uh, on the 15th. There was a public hearing held by the Hudson River Valley Commission, um, and uh, the commission had no, they advocated for preservation, but they had no authority to mandate that it be saved. Nonetheless, they held a hearing, and the Register Star said, feelings run hot at hotel hearing. Uh, there was a guy named a renowned architect and engineer, James Marston Finch of Columbia University School of Architecture, came to town and advocated for the worst preservation and was shouted down by some of the residents and told to sit down and was quoted in the Register Star saying, I've never been treated so rudely in my life. Um, but local folks calmed people down. He was allowed to continue to speak. Um, Mayor Wheeler asked state representatives to consider Hudson's position. Uh, he said, we must consider the people in the area and the cost to taxpayers of preservation. He added, generally, the feeling here, meaning in Hudson, is resentment of it's the- It's seven o'clock. Oh, okay, oh, <laughs> Resentment of the intrusion, that's my computer, sorry. It's quite annoying. 
I can't stop it. I don't have to stop it. <laughs> By the commission and the trust, because they don't trust us to govern our own city. The mayor said many years later, when I talked to him, it was as though someone pressed a button and I got telegrams from all over the country about the hotel. I even got one from Helen Hayes, the actress. So um, this went on, and as part of the preservation movement, um, the feds, the federal government, dispatched the interior. A guy, a, photo, a photographer by the name of Jack Boucher, I think I'm saying that right, <clears throat> and he was, he is still considered like the photographer and chronicler of American architecture, right? And uh, he worked for the Park Service. He he made uh, f uh, 10,000 photographs of 10,000 buildings over 47 years. Remarkable collection of American buildings. He came to Hudson in August of 1969, and he took 17 photos of the Worth as a part of the listing of the hotel on the National Register of Historic Places. This is one of them that you can see, one of the 17 that I mentioned. His notes are also, if you go to the Library of Congress website and just type in search Hudson General Worth, you'll get all of this, right? And here's another one. This is the lobby area in August 1969, uh, looking north. Uh, this is the dining room that you saw. Um, this is the staircase um, that went up to the second floor. So you can see the state uh, of the hotel. This was the hallways um, on the second floor. Um, uh, a typical bedroom on the second floor. And you can look out and see across the street. That's Warren Street. You can see the Howard, like what was maybe the Howard at the time. Yeah. And then uh, with no, no buyers, no real plan, uh, the work, general work, the mayor decided uh, in November of 1969 to tear down uh, the general worth. And within a month, uh, by December 19th, 1969, the hotel uh, was gone. And um, I, I looked up um, some of the things that people said at the time in the paper about the fact that this, the place had been raised. And, um, they expressed mixed emotions. Uh, many were happy the fire and health hazard had been eliminated, but all felt a part of the city's history had been lost forever. Uh, one lamented the large hole that now existed in, on Warren Street, comparing it to a missing front tooth. It just doesn't look right. Hudson won't be the same without the work. So that's my presentation. Yeah. I want to thank, uh, one thing I want to take some questions and love to just have a discussion. I don't know if John Craig is still here, one of the volunteers. He has to go. Did he go? Okay, yeah. so John is one of our great volunteers here in the history room. And he did a lot of, I said I'm not a historian, which you, you know, now you know. You have to hear me talk. Um, John did a lot of the research for me going through this, uh, our materials here in the history room and elsewhere. And this is just the beginning. There's a lot more stories that can be told. Unfortunately, a lot of the newspaper microfilm of the time, I couldn't find, a, for example, a picture of the building being torn down because those issues are missing <coughs> out of Columbia Green. Uh, so uh, I'm going to continue to do this. I'd really like to talk to people uh, similar to what I did with Pat Westerman, which was sort of an oral history. Lisa helped me with that. Lisa actually did it. Um, a oral history of folks who lived around or knew people who had events there. And so if you'd like to come up to me afterwards, I'm happy to talk to you and get your name. But with all that, I'll take your questions. Lance. The, the writer of that story was Chris Martin.